Hi there. In this video, I will review May 23 exams economics paper two for SL students. I hope this exam review video will be a bit of help for your productive economics revision. Then let's kick off the work. Yes, economics is standard level paper two. The exam time is given as one hour, 45 minutes, and we're supposed to answer only one question. Also, the maximum mark that we can expect to get is 14 marks. Let's get going for the actual questions. Question number one, read the extract and answer the questions that follow. All right, text A, overview of Uruguay, mm -mm -mm. the basic information of the population, GDP, and where does the country earn most of the money from, which is mostly commodity product, things like that. Inflation rate getting higher. Mm -mm -mm. Text B is about the potential trading blocks that the country is considering to join. First is the EU, second one, such a long name, Mercosur. I reckon the latter one has something to do with the fellow Latin American countries. Yes. Text C shares a bit more specific information about the bilateral um, trade agreement that the country considers to join. And table one, card account information, which is recording minus numbers. And text table two, selected income data, GNI, incre increasing, Gini index, mm, improving, good. Question A1, define the term GDP indicated in bold in the text. Let's define GDP. GDP presents the value of all final goods and services that are produced within an economy within a certain period of time. I reckon the keywords that we must include would be final goods and services. Yeah. A2, define the term sustainability indicated in bold in the text. This definition can be a bit more delicate, but here we go. The concept sustainability assumes that the economic activities are operating under the consideration that finite resources and overall environment should be protected and preserved so that such would not be extinct in the future. Simply saying, when economic activities are done, we consider the preservation and protection so that it would last healthily and sustainably for the future generations. That's the concept. Question B1, using information from table one, calculate the change in Uruguay's current account balance between 2018 and 19. Okay, quite straightforward. If you look at this one, to get the current account balance, I need to know what's inflow and outflow. Exports, inflow, imports, outflow. Net income, definitely inflow. Net current transfers, inflow. Then so all of them is going to be the current account balance in 2018. You do the same thing in 2019. So I can get change as $1.77 billion. B2, using information from table one, state whether Uruguay is facing a deficit or a surplus in its balance of trade and goods and services in 2019. We go back to the same data set. However, we don't consider these income or current transfers because the question only asks us to find out the balance within the goods and services. Then 2019, export inflow, import outflow. Obviously, if inflow looks bigger, then we can say the balance of trade is in the state of surplus. Using information from table two, Sketch the change in Uruguay's Lorentz curve from 2010 to 2015. 2010 to 15. Genie coefficient is getting 
better since the number is getting smaller, which is good. So I'm going to sketch the situation by comparing the two ears. So, so the drawing curve is shifting to the left in 2015, which shows the improvement of Gini index. That's all. Question C. Using a demand and supply diagram, explain how China might have contributed to the Uruguayan soybean producers' higher revenue. If I explain that with a diagram first, it's going to have higher demand, demand curve shifting to the right, and then I'm gonna put the situation in words. So, Since there is higher demand from China, which has led to higher price and higher quantity. That's what I can say. He, using exchange rate diagram, explain how the end of the commodity boom might have contributed to the depreciation of the peso. All right, since the boom is gone, there will be less demand for commodity products within the country. There will be less foreigners demanding peso. If I put the situation in the diagram, foreigners demand less of pesos with less demand for commodity products. And at the same time, explanation goes saying, as there is a fall in exports, it implies that foreigners would need to demand less peso to pay for the country's products consumption which decreases the demand for the peso and leads the fall in the exchange rate depreciation. Question E, using an appropriate diagram, explain how the new free trade agreement may lead to higher structural unemployment in Uruguay. Let's describe the situation with a labor market diagram. So fundamentally, there will be less demand for certain types of job within this region since the jobs uh, since the jobs have moved to the other regions where it would be cheaper or more, more productive. I put the explanation in words in here. So question F. Using an ADAS diagram explain the likely impact of the reduction of the common external tariff on Uruguay's potential outputs. Um, if there is reduction of common external tariff, make with the imported product cheaper. And what's going to be the impact of such policy to the long-term output? If it is the long-term output, then within the ADAS diagram, I need to check LRAS curve. Is it a good news? Yes, sure. The given reduction on the common external tariff would increase production efficiency, as I said, cheaper imports, more production, higher production, better production, things like that. Uh, therefore, it's going to increase competition and it's going to allow better resource allocation. So it can improve potential output of the country, shifting LRAS to the right. Last question, which is 15 marker essay question. Using information from the text data and your knowledge of economics, discuss the impact of economic integration on the Uruguayan economy. Discuss. The command term discuss means that I need to discuss both positive impact and at the same time negative impact of the uh, Uruguayan economy joining the trading blocks. To start the introduction, I'm going to put some generic information of defining some key terms. I'm going to put some general introduction about the Uruguayan economy. So what are the pros of being a member of the two different types of trading blocks? As you already know, I need to support my reasonings with the given information. Block joining a joining trading blocks would allow the country to access to bigger markets, which is good in a way. So that's the big reasoning. Second benefit is connected to the first one. Um, specifically saying the supply side of the country can have higher exports and it is actually able to improve the negative uh, balance of trade that we have already calculated from the table one. I want to point out the third benefit of 
uh, higher export revenue, which can contribute to higher economic growth rate and higher real GNI per capita, which can be also connected to reducing poverty rate of the country. Also, I read the fact that the country has been significantly benefited from the exporting to China. However, the thing is, this is not from any of the trading bloc uh, agreement or things like that, which means it is quite volatile and not very stable. So joining two other different different trading blocks would guarantee more stability. Following benefit of joining trading blocks would be freer trade within the economy can attract more FDIs. Nevertheless, there are certain concerns that the country should be wary of when it comes to considering joining the trading blocks. First of all, the government should neglect the fact that the country's economy is susceptible to external shocks inherently, which means the country is overly reliant on trade of primary products and it is not diversified enough to compete with other countries' products. In other words, I want to point out the fact that allowing more foreign products freely uh, to the country's market can be a like absolute losing game to the Uruguayan economy, fundamentally. Lower the protectionist measures by joining the trading blocks would uh, lead to higher structural unemployment since the country is not very competitive to produce certain products more cheaply or productively. I also want to point out the fact that the country has been suffering from low sub sovereignty. Potentially, it can prevent the country from entering the trade agreement in the first place, at the same time sustaining within the trade agreement in, uh, in the fundamental sense. All right, with these contents, I'm going to compose my 15 marker essay to discuss the impact of economic integration on the Uruguayan economy. Here comes question two. Text D, overview of Cameroon. The text provides overview information of the country, such as population, GDP, poverty state, FDI state, and exchange rate system is in fixed. All right. Next text gives us the information about the growth and employment strategy that the country is trying to adopt to make the country to be more productive and prospering. Things like that. And text F is giving us the information about the free trade agreement with the EU and the UK. Mm -mm. We can see that Cameroon has signed, already signed the FTA with the EU and the UK. And it is largely relying on trading with these two. Mm -mm. Table three gives us the inflation index CPI. Increasing, inflation going on, nominal interest rate increasing. Mm -mm -mm. Table four, Cameroon's main export market. Okay, as I've just checked, EU and UK taking nearly half of the uh, export trade. China, next, India, US, all right. Question A1, definition question, relative poverty. Relative poverty refers to an income level below a specified level, uh, technically compared to a certain percentage of the median income within a country. What is interesting about this type of poverty is that every country has different definition of the relative poverty level because every country has different median income level. A2, define the term infrastructure indicated in bold in the text. Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure refers to a certain type of system and facilities that are necessary for economic activity of a country. Uh, to be more specific, the operation of such create significant positive externalities that are largely provided by government. B1, using the information in Table 3, calculate the inflation rate in Cameroon in 2019, okay? We can use CPI data. The difference between these two years divided by the previous year. So if I write them down, don't forget to multiply the value with the 100 so that you can get the percentage. Here we go. B2, 
Using the information in table three on your answer to P1, calculate the real interest rate in Cameroon in 2019. I know what is the inflation rate, and I know the nominal interest rate, so I can minus one from the other, then I can get the real interest rate. What's the year? 2000, 2019, 7.94. So the real interest rate is 5.52. Next, using an appropriate diagram, illustrate unemployment, which may arise from the imposition of a minimum wage. All right, sure. If there is a minimum wage, it is increasing the cost of production. So it's going to make the producers to cut off some of the employment. There is a gap between labor suppliers and labor demanders. So here we have surplus, in other words, unemployment. Question C. Using an ADS diagram, explain how its pensionary fiscal policy has supported economic growth in Cameroon. Expansionary fiscal policy, mm -mm, quite simple. Either increasing government spending or decreasing tax collection. And let's put the situation in graph first. AD shifting to the right, how it works. Let's write down. Conducting an expansionary fiscal policy implies that government spending is increasing or taxes being lowered so that it would increase consumption and investment that are the direct components of AD so that it's going to increase on, on, so that it's going to increase real GDP. That's how it works. Next question, using an exchange rate diagram, explain how capital flight may increase the overvaluation of the franc, which is the currency of the country. Let me put the diagram first. What we really have to pay attention in this diagram is that, as we already have checked, the country adopts fixed exchange rate system, which means the exchange rate is fixed like this. Mm -mm. But then the country is experiencing capital flight. What does that mean? The money is outflowing from the country. So that money supply is increasing. More Cameroonists, does it make sense? People, more people from Cameroon would like to uh, change their currency to different currencies. So supply is going to increase within this market. So more currency would be overvalued. More quantity of the currency would be overvalued. I'm going to put the rambling that I just did in words. Question A, using a demand and supply diagram, explain how government subsidy helps to keep food prices low. Hmm. Subsidy, which is a good news to the producers, incentivizing production, supply shift to the right, Decreasing prices, increasing quantities. To be more, to be more precise, subsidy would incentivize and reduce the cost of production, hence lead to greater supply and lower prices. Question F. Using an international trade diagram, explain the effect of removing tariffs on the imports of fertilizers into Cameroon. Removing tariffs is a good news, obviously, since it's going to make the world price cheaper. So, diagram first. Removing the tariff will result in a decrease in the price of fertilizers and hence an increase in the quantity of imports due to an increase in the quantity demanded by the domestic consumers and Domestic suppliers would a bit lose its competitiveness so that how does import change? It's going to change from Q2 to Q3 to Q1 to Q4. Very last essay question. Using information from the text and dates, text to data and your knowledge of economics, discuss the need for a balance between market-oriented policies and government interventionist policies 
when it comes to achieve economic development in Cameroon. So there are two different types of policies. So we are discussing which one is better or to be more objectively, we have to find out some pros and cons of each policy so that we can somehow suggest the balance between two policies to be adopted for the government. As you can expect, I'm gonna fill out my intro content with definitions. And body one, I'm going to focus on suggesting benefits of conducting interventionist policies to the Cameroon government. Interventionist policies would refer to the fact that when it comes to achieving economic growth or when it comes to plan economic activities of a country, the government is going to take control. In other words, the government is going to take the lead, what to do, what not to do, or things like that. So what's the benefit of such type of policy? First, I want to say active government intervention can bring stability to a region's persistent conflict since the country is politically or just in general quite unstable, having lots of conflict, as we have read. Also, also if government-led policies are done according to the interventionist idea, uh, the strategy would help increase human capital and increase productivity fundamentally. So it's going to be a bit long term and the fundamental, um, fundamental way to make the country's economy to be boosted. Thirdly, government-led economic plans can establish better infrastructure and it would bring in FDI from the foreign countries more stably and it's gonna last longer, right? So that's why. Last benefit that I would love to point out is the government subsidies the government subsidies that are given to necessity goods, such as electricity, food, fuel, these are so necessary for basic and fundamental economic activities. So that has to be persisted. However, there are some limitations on relying solely on interventionist policies. First, fiscal deficits are quite high and it is increasing, going to somehow limit the government's sustainable and stable spending on economic growth. And some forms of intervention are too short term, such as only giving subsidies, which are not really lasting for like a long time, would not highly contribute to improve the economic development status of the country seen from the long term. The biggest limitation of interventionist policies huge opportunity cost. Lastly, uh, active government intervention means for now, it's going to mean the military intervention. In other words, it may somehow deter the freedoms and uh, healthy development of the country, to be honest. It's time to do the same thing for the market-oriented policies. What are the benefits first? most representative example of market-oriented policies is deregulation and it is going to lead to an increase in private investment since the firms have more freedom to start the business run the businesses things like that so it's going to promote business productivity second example of market-oriented policy is to allow more foreign competitors too such as by joining free trade agreement things like that done, the country can earn higher export revenue, which would lead to economic growth. For the moment, the country has too high export reliance on UK and the EU, so I believe it has to be diversified to the different countries too. Especially if tariffs are removed on fertilizers that the country is heavily focusing on to export, it's going to make the cost to be cheaper and it's going to make the export competitiveness will be boosted. So the industry, the fertilizer industry would be more productive and sustainable and contribute to the economic development in the long term. From the last body paragraph, I would love to talk about the limitations that still exist even to the market-oriented policies. As it is proven by the G curve, in the short term, being a member of free trade groups may worsen or not necessarily reduce the country's persistent trade deficit. 
so that in the short term, the country cannot really be benefited by the free trade agreement. So that's the limitation of the market-oriented uh, policy. Having said that, without adequate provision of infrastructure and provision of education, the country will continue to lack diversification and competitiveness with foreign competition so that economic growth at the same time economic development may not be possible only because of the market-oriented policies. Last type of market-oriented policy, such as giving some tax incentives or giving subsidies or things like that, about them, they are not necessarily benefit those people who are working in the informal sector because government doesn't really know how to provide tax incentives or subsidies to those unrecorded workers. So uh, it can have somehow limited effectiveness, to be honest. Therefore, it's not going to be like heavily contribute to reducing poverty as a result, economic development. So what's the conclusion? I would love to say the government should find a decent balance between the two policies rather than relying on only one. Yes, this is the finished outline of 15 marker essay. Such a long one, however, necessary. With these content, last job is to compose a proper essay. Right. Finally, this is the end. Thank you so, so much. If you have come this much far to finish watching this video. Thank you so much. I will see you with more of revision videos. Bye.